with the Texas <laughs> Trial Lawyers Association um, testifying against the bill. But there are aspects of the lawyer advertising that we have seen that raise questions in all of our minds as to the propriety of the advertising and the manner in which it's done and whether it reflects favorably on our profession. And that's a concern that we all share. However, there are also certain guarantees that apply to such things as the First Amendment, free speech. And there can be restraints on free speech, and there is no such thing as commercial free speech. But in context in which you attempt to limit advertising, the recommendation I would make to the committee is that we proceed very carefully because of the sanctity of the First Amendment. And it was interesting that you that we talked about blood thinners because Pradaxa was a blood thinner with which I was personally involved. And um, Pradaxa was put on the market under with the representation that it did not need to be monitored when the truth of the matter is that it could not be monitored. And the reason I bring that up is because in the the people that marketed Pradaxa spent $110 million in direct-to-consumer advertising, and that direct-to-consumer advertising has to meet the same standards that we seek to impose on the lawyers who are advertising relative to the same drug. In other words, there's a duty on the part of the manufacturer of that drug to be fair and impartial in the presentation of the risks and the benefits associated with the use of the drug so that if there's a hazard associated with the use of the drug, the potential user is aware of it through the direct-to-consumer advertising. And I note that this bill contains penalties to be imposed upon people who have misrepresented that a drug is withdrawn from the market when it hasn't been withdrawn, is being investigated when it's not being investigated. And the only thing that I would that I would ask that this committee entertain is that, number one, the, the constraints that are imposed have to meet constitutional tests and standards, and that we have to approach very carefully the manner in which we limit the ability of lawyers to advertise with regard to a drug that truly has defects. And Pradaxa itself possess such defects, and they themselves were, were sanctioned by the, by the uh, FDA because they represented that their drug reduced the risk of stroke and some systemic embolism by 35% over warfarin. And that, in the minds of most people, says, well, that's a 35% risk reduction. The actual numbers, Mr. Chairman, were with warfarin, there were 3.4 strokes per 100. With Pradaxa, there were 2.2. And the FDA said this advertisement is misleading and misrepresents the actual nature of the risk, and you're going to have to change the material that you distribute, not only to the medical community, but to the public through direct-to-consumer advertising. I see that you're I think your clock may be wrong, but it appears that, that it appears that it I'm out not, of time. It is not wrong, and Mr. Gallagher. I, I promise I, you that it's slow. I know, I must, sadly, I'm finished. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being a good sport. Members, any questions? Okay. You do. All right, Vice Chair Farrar. You had mentioned um, when you, we, you were beginning your presentation that the bar, um, the state bar, has. So, so guidelines on the advertising. Can you can you elaborate on those? Um, the state bar already requires many of the things that are required in this bill, and w relative to the accuracy and the truthfulness of things that are contained in advertising, and they do an excellent job of policing that and enforcing those and enforcing the provisions that are contained in our canons of ethics and in our DRIs relative to advertising. For instance, you can't advertise that a product has been withdrawn when it has not. And uh, the bill also requires that it identify itself as an advertisement. 
and representative fraud, that's in our DRIs now. You have to you have to identify at the beginning and at the conclusion and after commercial breaks that this is an advertisement and that it is not a a a, a product of any governmental entity. It says lawyer advertisement, legal advertisement, and has to do so prominently so that there can be no misrepresent no no mistake about that. In, are you aware what the consequences are of the, of the bar for violators? The the bar can impo- the bar can make you withdraw the advertising the advertisement immediately, and depending upon the gravity of the circumstance, they can impose sanctions. You know what those sanctions are? It varies from case to case, and from and uh, up to disbarment. Uh, up to disbarment. <laughs> And um, but but that's that's it, it's determined on a on a fact by fake facts situation. But my recommendation is that if you if if there is a circumstance in which there's a misrepresentation that warrants in the minds of this committee the imposition of a financial sanction against the advertiser, that should be equally applicable to the drug industry if they misrepresent their product to the consumers. Because whoever said a moment ago that oftentimes older people are the ones that are targeted because that's that's your diabetic market. That's where you have the, the various hypertension. And those are the people that are targeted. And I have seen uh, there, 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 there are documentations where we don't want to make our advertisements too scary, but we want to motivate people to respond and to purchase our drugs through the DTC program, which is direct to consumer advertising. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, members. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Gallagher.